Shabbat Shalom. Are you ready to, to sing and pray and worship this morning? Let's do so with Psalm 27. everybody. Uh, please rise as we bless the Lord. Father, we, we give you glory today as always. This is your Sabbath, a time where we meet with you, a time that we worship you and we celebrate you and we celebrate your son, Messiah Yeshua, in whose name we pray. Amen. Who is this King of glory?
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you stars. Let the waters above the heavens and the highest heavens praise him. They will praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were. He made a decree establishing them forever and ever. It shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You sea monsters and all the deep Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, making his word full. Mountains as well as hills, fruit as well as cedars. Wild beasts as well as cattle, creeping things as well as the birds of the air. Kings of the earth and all their nations, princes and all who rule the earth. Young men and young women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord. His name alone is to be exalted. His majesty is over all earth and heaven. He has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his righteous ones, the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. I think you were mentioned in this accounting to praise the Lord. So let's do that. Amen.
now as we face the ark and face Jerusalem and we offer more blessings to the Lord who is worthy to be praised. seated for a moment. Voices with Rivkas as we proclaim the Shema, the watchword of Israel. Shema Israel.
take those words of comfort and um, the words of the, the prophets, the words that we sing this morning of hallelujahs from psalms, and let's take these words and hold it within us, and let's turn to the words of the page of the Amidah, page 86 and 87, and approach the throne room with confidence. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Elohe avoteinu, Elohe Abraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe Yaakov. Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor ve'anora, El elion. Gomer chasedim tovim, ve'kone hako, ve'zoche chasdei ha'ot. Umevi go elib nevenehem, leman shemo behava, melechose umashia umagen, baruchata adonai magen ahavam. 
גיבור לעולם אדוני, מחיי מתים אתה, רב להושיע. משיב הרוח ומוריד הגשם. מחכה חיים בחסד, מחיי מתים ברחמים רבים. צום נג נופלים וחופי חולים, ומתיר אסורים, ומקיים אמונתו לשני עפר. מי כמוך בעד גבורות, ומי דומה לך. ומצמיח ישוע, ונאמן אתה להחיות מתים. ברוך אתה אדוני מחיה שם שמקדישים אותו בשמי מרום ככתוב על יד נביאך וקרא זה אל זה ואל מה קדוש, 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 אדוני צבאו מלוך על הארץ כבודו. אז בקור רעש גדול, אדיר וחזק, משמיעים כל מתנשאים לעומת צרפים, לעומתם ברוג יומיהו. Blessed are you, Lord, from his abode, Lord. It is you who decrees death, restores life. It is you who causes salvation to come forth. It is you who are faithful to revive the dead. It is you who brought the, the, the Redeemer. It is you, Lord, who, who loves us. It is you, Lord, who will dwell forever and forever in your, in your throne on, on, in, in Sion, in Yerushalayim. It is you, Lord, whose holiness may be seen in your city. Through all generations, may our eyes, Lord, behold your kingdom. We, Lord, declare your greatness from generation to generation. We will proclaim your holiness. Your praise, Lord, shall be on our mouth, and it shall never depart. For you, Lord, are a great and mighty and merciful king. Blessed are you, Lord, the Holy One.
place to end that last song, You Shall Not Be Afraid, as we um, get ready to open up the Torah and learn from uh, the, the Passover Parsha, the Passover Parsha, and um, this is, um, anyone who's been part of a Passover Seder knows that there's four questions, and this is where three of the questions come from, um, because Moses has an opportunity now to talk to the elders, and um, you would think that it would, could be a, maybe a victory speech perhaps, or maybe it's a, um, a speech about what's to come in the desert or whatever he's going to be thinking about. But God has him to tell one thing. Remember when your children ask you this, this is what you shall say. And I feel like this is Moses' great commission, and we've heard that great commission as well. Um, Yeshua, as our pastor over Lamb as well, gives us a great commission, and it's, it's the same thing. It's one of memory, of history, of telling others about this great salvation that we've experienced. And we know this because it's, it's experienced by, um, by the children of Israel. Well, you can be seated for a moment. And we have um, a special occasion in Carl, um, in, in the Rose family. And that is Esri's um, first birthday. So happy birthday, Esri. If I would have... I know one of um, Ezri's favorite songs, and if I would have been more thoughtful, we would have played that song for you <laughs> this Shabbat, Ezri, but we will get it next time. Ein kamocha belohim Adonai ve'ein kamasecha malachutcha malchut kol alamim u'memshotcha bechol dor v'ador Adonai melech Adonai Malach, Adonai Imloch, Le'olam Vaed. Adonai Oz Le'amo Yitain, Adonai Yavarech Et Amo Bashalom. Av HaRachamim, Hetiv Abitzoncha, Et Zion. Tivnei chomot Yerushalayim Tivnei chomot Yerushalayim Ki vecha levad batachnu Melech el Ramvanisa Please rise. Vayehi ben Soharon, Vayome Moshe, Kuma Donai, Vea Futsu Roya Vecha, Vea Nusu Missanecha, Mipanecha, Kimetzion. Tetze Torah, Ki Mitzion, Tetze Torah, Udevar Adonai, Mi Yerushalayim, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Le'amo Yisrael, Bikdu Shato. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai
exalt the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We'd like to invite forward this morning for the Aliyah, Howard Salberg, 
ויעזור ויגן לישוע לכך עושים בו נאמר אמן. תעמוד אשר צבי בן שמואל יוסף לתורה. May he help shield and save all who trust him and let us say amen. Ascribe greatness to our God and honor to the Torah. We thank you, Lord. We desire to cling to the Lord our God, all who are alive today. Baruchu et Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Barcha Banu Mikol HaAmim V'Natan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen ויהום אדוני אל משה ואל אהרון וארץ מצרים לאמור החודש הזה לכם ראש חדשים ראשון הוא לכם לחדשי השנה דברו אל כל עדת ישראל לאמור ועשה לחודש הזה ויכו להם איש סלע בית אבות סלע בית. ואם יאמת הבית מיות מסה ולקחו שכנו הקרוב אל ביתו במכסת נפשות איש לפי אכלו תחוסו על הסה, סה תמים, זכה בן שנה יהיה לכם, מן הכבשים ומן עזים תיקחו, והיה לכם למשמרת עד ארבע עשר יום לחודש הזה. ושחטו אותו כה כהל עדת ישראל, כל עדת ישראל בין הערבי בבאים. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר נתן לנו תורת אמת וחיי עולם נטע בתוכנו ברוך אתה אדוני נותן התורה. אמן. אמן. משבח אבותינו אברהם יצחק ויעקב שיער רבך רחל ולאה. Blessed are you Lord Abraham, blessed our ancestors Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel and Leah. May you also bless Howard who has been called to the Torah to give praise and thanks to the Lord for all the good that he has bestowed upon him. May the Holy One, blessed be He, protect Him, sustain Him, direct His heart in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, to be perfect and complete with the Lord, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments all the days of His life. And we say together, Amen. 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 Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Noel Lerner to come up. Noel has a special prayer uh, for the hostages Uh, Noel and I and Lynn and Rebecca attended uh, uh, a program for, uh, for the hostages and family members were in attendance from there and spoke at uh, Beth Orr this week and that really moved us to uh, make a special prayer for this day. It, it's fitting that we're reading uh, this passage um, of the Israelites being freed from Egypt and last Sunday commemorated the 100th day of the hostages' captivity. And all over the world, there were 100 cities where there were gatherings in commemoration. And oddly enough, Chapel Hill was one of them. And there were about 200 people that got together, marching with signs saying, bring them home now, and carrying uh, 
pictures of hostages and hearing from two members of the community. You know, one of the hostages, um, um, I think it's Omri Siegel, uh, grew up in Chapel Hill and was a Tar Heel. So these women had strong connections uh, to the hostages. And as Michael said, on, uh, on Tuesday at Temple Beth Or, there was another gathering and service where they spoke as well as two other, uh, two other family members of hostages. And you know, they asked a couple of things. One is, you know, we just celebrated where's his one year birthday and uh, there's a baby who's on Sunday celebrated his one year and a third of his life was in captivity. And there are also people as old as 86 who need medicine. And the message they had was that we've got to work to bring them home now. And every day is critical. I don't know how many of you saw that uh, there was a, a video of Noah and two other men and that, that was shown uh, either last week or the week before and those two men were killed. So every day that uh, the hostages are there is another day that another one of them may die. And w what they asked is that you contact you know, your local politicians to let them know that we have to keep them alive and they need to come home now. And uh, if you can contact the hostages family, it means a lot. You know, if you lived on a, the other side of the world and you received just a note saying, we're praying for you, what that would mean to them. So you could look up on the internet, bring them home now, and that'll bring you to a site. There's also the hostage family um, forum. And there you can, you can see pictures of the individual hostages, pray for them, or like I say, get in contact. I'm, I, got, I thought about the person who I, I carried and I found out on December 8th he was killed, where they found his body then. So uh, here's a prayer. Shomer Yisrael, guardian of Israel, we call out to you. fervent plea and prayer to bless and protect. <laughs> the civilian men, <laughs> women, and children brutally kidnapped by Hamas and held captive in Gaza, along with members of Israel's defense forces missing in action or held captive May it be your will speedily and soon to bring them out from the darkness and shadow of death. May the Holy One of blessing break their bonds, deliver them from their distress, and release them swiftly back to the light. <laughs> Embrace of their dear ones. Do all of it must be done so that relief, rescue, and long life may be the lot of every one of the soldiers and civilians who have been taken hostage. Lord, we pray for families who have lost loved ones or have loved ones still in captivity. Our hearts are torn and we are just human. How much more must your heart be torn when you see the suffering? Father, let those who grieve and suffer today feel the comfort of your embrace. Lord, we pray for the hostages, please. <laughs> Bring them home safely. Let your peace wash over their families 
as they await news of their loved ones. Act on their behalf, Lord. Take up their cause without delay so that you fulfill through them. Your verse from Isaiah. Those redeemed by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will surely overtake them. And sorrow and sigh will flee away. So it may be your will, and in Yeshua's name, let us say amen. amen. Thank you, Noel. And as a reminder, the Stand With Israel e-news that I sent out earlier this week has information about the hostages and the family forum and links to uh, ways that you can support uh, the families and to pray for them. And the, uh, there's also a copy of the letter or the stand, uh, that you can send to your representative and uh, just some other good information. And on the 28th, uh, when we meet again uh, to worship uh, at 7 p.m. on the 28th, uh, we stand with Israel worship as spiritual warfare too. We'll have a special time of prayer and lifting up the hostages and their families there as well. Well, Misha Beirach Abutenu, Abraham, Yitzhak, the Yaakov, the Imateno, Isara, Rivka, Raquel, Velea. May the one who blessed our ancestors, the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the matriarchs Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless and heal all who are ill. Please call out the names of those that are on your heart. May the Blessed One overflow with compassion to them, restore them, to heal them, to strengthen them, to enliven them. May the One send them speedily a complete healing, healing of the soul, healing of the body, along with all the ill among the people of Israel and humankind, soon, speedily, and without delay. And let us say, Amen. I'd like to invite Joseph forward for the Hagbah as we hold on to the word which is true, sure, faithful, and we hold on to it and we lift it up and we look at it and we know that God's word will not return to us void. Let's stand together. You can be seated. And Nancy, please come forward for the reading of the English. Shabbat shalom. Our Torah portion comes from Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn from every womb of B'nai Israel, both men and animals. This is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by a strong hand, Adonai brought you out from this place. No hommets may be eaten. This day, in the month of Aviv, you are going out. When Adonai brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this service during this month. 
For seven days you are to eat matzah, and the seventh day is to be a feast to Adonai. Matzot is to be eaten throughout the seven days, and no hummets is to be eaten among you, nor within any of your borders. You are to tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. So it will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder between your eyes, so that the Torah of Adonai may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, Adonai has brought you out of Egypt. You are to keep this ordinance as a moed from year to year. The half Torah is from Jeremiah, chapter 46, verses 25 through 28. Adonai Zebaot, the God of Israel, says, Behold, I will punish Ammon of No, Pharaoh, Egypt, with her gods and her kings, even Pharaoh and them that trust in him. I will hand them over to those seeking their lives into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and his servants. Yet afterwards it will be inhabited as in the days of old. It is a declaration of Adonai. But you fear not, my Jacob. Fear not, Jacob, my servant, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, your offspring from the land of their exile. And Jacob will return and be at peace and secure, no one frightening him. Fear not, Jacob, my servant. It is a declaration of Adonai, for I am with you. I will make a full end of all the nations where I have driven you, but I will not make a full end of you. I will discipline you with justice, but will not utterly destroy you. The brick Kadashah is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the ruling Kohanim and Torah scholars, he began to inquire of them where the Messiah was to be born. So they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, bring word back to me so that I may come and worship him as well. After listening to the king, they went their way. And behold, the star they had seen in the east went on before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great gladness. And when they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother Miriam, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another way. Thank you. Let's all stand together as we declare that it is a tree of life to those who take hold of it. Its ways are ways of pleasant, pleasant and all its paths are peace. It's Shalom. 
seated for a moment and we'd like to call forward our Parsha partners. Parsha partners, good to see you today. That's a very colorful yarmulke you got on there today. All right, well here we are in um, the book, remind me what, what book we're in. We're in the book, the second book of, of the Torah, which is the book of yeah, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just say it. Exodus. Um, anyone know the, the Parsha this week, what it's called? It's the shortest name Parsha that's in all the Parshiot. It's a it's pretty, pretty easy one to say, actually. Yeah, it's Bo. Bo. And um, this is how I always remember what's inside Bo. It's not a Bo, but, but Bait is what letter of the Hebrew alphabet? Is it like the first, the second, the third, the fourth? Second. So everyone hold up two. Okay, and the second part of Bo is Aleph. What, what letter is Aleph in the Hebrew alphabet? So add those two together. Two plus one. Three, yep. And, um, and that's the, th there's three, the last three plagues are in this Parsha. And that's how you remember that. So Bo has the last three plagues. Anyone know one of those last three plagues? There's one, of course, that we always kind of are sad about in some way because it's a sad thing. The death of the first one. That's a really, really sad one, isn't it? Um, anyone know another one? Darkness, and there's a third. This darkness is scary too. Um, locust is the other one. Locust, locust, um, locust. Darkness in the death of the firstborn. Now, um, I want to. Do you guys ever have any questions about things? Look outside. Do you have any any, any questions? I have a question. Like, how does um, eyelash serum work? I've recently learned about eyelash serum. And I don't know how it works, and I want to know. That's one of my questions this morning. I now, want to know how, the, how a computer works. You want to know how a computer works? Anybody else have any questions? You probably got a few. This morning I was trying to count how many um, questions we sang, like, who is this king of glory? That's a question, right? And we also, um, there were a lot of other questions that we actually, we, 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 um, we sang about or, or prayed, prayed with. Any other questions? You, do you have questions or not? Yes. Go ahead. you have a question? Why did God make mosquitoes? <laughs> no, but that's a great question because mosquitoes, I mean, I like that question. We can think about that. And I'm like, they, they draw blood, but they don't really give back. They don't really pollinate. Like, I'm, I can see. Anyway, anyway, I can see that you guys have lots of questions. Now, that's in this Parsha. This is what I think. It's, it's called the Passover Parsha. We learn about the lamb. We learn about the lamb that's brought into the house and it's examined for a couple days before the lamb is slaughtered and the blood protects the, the, our homes. You know the story of Passover so well and it should be known so well. We should remember it all the year long, not just during, during, during Passover. Um, but Moshe says, listen, one day your children are going to ask questions. And that's like the most important thing he has to say. You would think he has so many other things to say, but that's, the, that's what he t he's telling the people. So this is my charge to you. Ask lots of questions. Ask lots of questions. Some questions are easy, right? Some questions are easy. Some questions are hard. And your parents have questions too. I know they do. And that's the way God made us, to ask questions about who he is, ask questions about, hey, how has he been faithful in your life? Hey, has there been times that you had a hard time trusting God? That's a question. All these are really good questions that I know that you'll start to ask, that your parents will continue to ask. And every one of God's creation, I think, asks these questions too. So, Avinu, Lord, we pray that we would be um, um, children of you that would ask questions, the hard ones, the easy ones, sometimes the challenging ones, where we haven't seen your right, strong right arm, that strong right arm that we know it happened in English in, in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, but we haven't seen it, and we're praying for it. And we want it, but we know that you have um, your time and your way, and we, um, we trust you and have faith for that will be all for your purposes. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.
Shabbat Shalom. Um, how many of the parents with young children or recently young children were very thankful that we were, our kids were told to ask more questions than they already ask uh, right now? So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wexler. <laughs> so just a few community highlights today. Uh, the first is uh, about Hebrew. So uh, Ms. Barb Litauer is still uh, teaching Hebrew. We have three courses that are going on now. We have Hebrew Blast Off, uh, the Hebrew One Continuation, and Hebrew Four. So you know if you fit into those categories. And I know uh, registration uh, is open. There's registration in the fly or there's a flyer in the foyer. There's the e-news. There's here in this announcement, Miss Barbara is here, and you can also find that at intershalom.org. So several ways to connect into the Hebrew classes that are going on right now. Um, next is a, a food drive headed by Noah Wallace. We were thinking about, I was thinking about this. Generally, we hear canned food drive, and this is really not a canned food drive. It's things that last long on a shelf food drive. So they're looking for rice, cereal, beans, nut butters, broth, crackers, jellies, and of course, the canned foods, uh, canned uh, vegetables and fruit are also welcome. But I think this is going to more than one food pantry in the area. So as we bring these in, um, we're going to be distributing to, I think, splitting between two different food banks. One, of course, over at Dorcas, and I don't remember where the other one is. But please, uh, through February uh, 3rd, so the next couple weeks, bring in your food. Uh, there's a place out for it in the foyer, and we'll be taking that over uh, to those food pantries. So I think some of you, many of you get the newsletter, uh, and, and I think um, Mike sent out this week the companion guide. So one of the goals going forward is to send out some discussion questions to the series that Mike is doing, Good News of Matthew, the Basora, the report from the battlefield. So the goal is to send these out in a separate newsletter um, towards the beginning of the week, I think, so that those discussion questions are there for you to think about, to talk about with your families, and to prepare uh, in between uh, the, the services and the messages each week. So looking forward to that, and I did see those this week. Um, it's a good, great start to kind of getting your mindset into to Matthew, not just on Saturday mornings and Shabbat mornings, but throughout the week as well. So uh, Mike, Mike shared this earlier, but we stand with Israel, so that newsletter is going out uh, each week. We also want to continue to, to keep those uh, remaining in, in captivity and the hostages in prayer and their families, as was shared earlier. And Mike also shared the, the worship as warfare, as spiritual warfare too. So not tomorrow, but the following week uh, at 7 p.m. Here, I know we had a, a good time of worship uh, back in November, shortly after the, the hostages, hostage situation uh, in, on, from October 7th. Um, we're going to continue that. And a lot of people were, were blessed by that time and really want to come together and use that worship time as spiritual warfare in that circumstance and other circumstances that, that you may be going through now. So we have uh, Panim El Panim. I, I keep thinking about this whenever we see this one. Uh, Messianic Jewish music, and it's a course that's already ongoing, um, led by Dr. Um, Greg Silverman. I don't know if any of you remember being at the Asheville Music Festival, but Dr. Greg Silverman was one of the artists at the Asheville Music Festival. This is from my recall, but it was like an 11 p.m. time slot. I think it was a later time slot that he had. Um, but it was him and his piano. It was a, a good time of worship there, and he's the one that's leading this, this portion here. And the next one is actually open, registration for the next Panim El Panim class, um, which is Unraveling Israeli-Palestinian Relations. So a timely uh, message and series, and also looking back at some of the historical context and answering some of the questions of the origins of the conflict in that area. So that is uh, open, Zoom class, the registration is open, Zoom class meets Mondays in February, so starting next month at 7 p.m., and you can go to MJTI's website for more information and to register for that. Just a reminder uh, for Sadaka, uh, the giving box is in the back there. Uh, we want to just remind you that regular giving is a, is a foundational part of the congregational's life and the ability to continue to offer the, the many things that our community does and brings, brings us together. And then lastly, the prayer wall is still out there. This, this theme this morning and, and continues to be 
uh, prayer for Israel, for the situation that's happening there, for the hostages and their families. That prayer wall is there uh, for us to remember, for us to uh, write names, for us to write prayers, uh, scriptures, things that we want to see lifted up in the land of Israel. Um, and that is there for you. So please leave a sticky note. And um, uh, I, I'm not sure how long that will be there, but it's there still and there's still room. So there's plenty of, of space to, to put those messages up. Thank you. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Before we get started, I, do, I would like our Israeli representative to please stand. Um, uh, he's a member of the reserves in the IDF, and I think we should re uh, reach out with our hands and pray uh, for his protection. Father, we lift up our brother now, Lord, who is serving, uh, serving you in many ways, uh, serving the IDF, serving by being here um, uh, at the Israel Gala uh, that Hal is uh, leading. And we just, we bless him, Lord. We pray protection over him and over his family. We thank him, Lord, for his steadfastness to serve not just the, the, the people of Israel, Am Yisrael, but uh, the nation as well. But most importantly, serving his God, Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, brother. I get the first slide up there. There we go. If it advances, it does. Thank you. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So uh, we're continuing with uh, Matthew's uh, gospel, the good news, the Bessera, a report from the battlefield. And as we said uh, previously, the goal in our study is to do what Matthew wanted his readers to do, to develop a life of discipleship based on the words he memorized about the life the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, and the kingdom of God that Messiah brought into the world. I've said this before, I'll say it again, we need to get back to the basics of our faith. A firm foundation is essential to our walk in Yeshua. And Matthew's gospel reveals to us the character of Yeshua, and so unveils for us the very heart of God. And as we study Matthew, we continue, we come to know Yeshua better and better especially as we continue to follow him in our struggles, in our joys, and in our ways. Let's pray. Father, we bless you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this service. We thank you uh, for the ability to pray openly, to worship you openly, to, um, to be blessed by our relationship with you through Messiah. Lord, would you bless this time this morning, not just a time of hearing words, in the typical sense, but hearing and applying them as you would have us apply. We bless you, we thank you, in Yeshua's name. Well, just by way of review, we looked last week at the book of the generations of uh, Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And as we said, there are many ancestral names that we recognize from the Tanakh, names such as Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Boaz, Jesse, David the king, and Solomon, they all filled in this genealogy. And we were also fascinated by the genealogy, including uh, four women, likely Gentiles. That they were members of uh, Yeshua's family tree. Ultimately, the Holy Messiah was born into the family of Joseph and his wife, Mary. And we said that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, from David to the Babylonian exile, another 14, and then the third 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. And that second half, the latter half of the chapter, transitioned to the birth of Yeshua and mainly concerned his earthly parents. Mary, we learn, became pregnant by the Ruach HaKodesh. And Joseph was likely completely undone by the news that, of Mary's pregnancy. Nevertheless, he was a good man. We said he's a mensch, and he did not want to expose her publicly to embarrass her or to even have her stoned. So he decided to privately divorce her. However, the angel of the Lord informed Joseph in a dream that he must, uh, what, in, what must have been the most amazing of birth reveals, uh, that he shouldn't be afraid to marry Mary as his wife because the child was conceived through the Ruach HaKodesh. 
Furthermore, the angel Lord told Joseph that Mary was going to have a son and that Joseph should name the child Yeshua. And if this announcement and direction wasn't enough, the angel said that the child's name was also the child's future mission because Yeshua would save his people from their sins. And all of this took place, Matthew tells us, to fulfill what was said by the prophet Isaiah, that a virgin will have a child called Emmanuel, God with us. When Joseph woke from his dream, he did everything the angel of the Lord required him to do. He married Mary, named her son Yeshua, who said Joseph was a Zadika, a faithful and obedient, righteous dude. I like that title. So one might assume that as an innocent, young, newlywed couple, Joseph and Mary were wonderfully happy. If so, they were rudely awakened out of their newlywed bliss by a deadly decree from Caesar Augustus that forced them to brace themselves against a tidal wave of tribulation that would push the family to its limits. And through the four Gospels, though the four Gospels are strangely silent about Yeshua's infancy and adolescence, Matthew gives us a few intriguing glimpses into this turbulent childhood. Before he concludes the second chapter, Matthew will escort us through many months and thousands of miles of travel, a wide-ranging itinerary that includes far away locations such as Persia, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Egypt, and Nazareth. Let's dive in. Now after Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is one who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when, Herod, when King Herod heard, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called them all together, all the ruling Kohanim and Torah scholars, he began to inquire of them where the Messiah was to be born. So they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Matthew here is emphasizing the contrast between Herod's rule with that of Yeshua. Namely, Matthew wants us to know that Yeshua is the son of David and so Israel's true king. Throughout the gospel, Matthew frequently challenges prejudices that favor political powers. Matthew, we will see, is not a fan of earthly kings. Concerning the Magi, we must not think that their question meant, where is one born to become king of the Jews? But rather, where is one born king of the Jews? Yeshua's kingly status was not given to him later. It was from his birth. He is the royal light that came into the world to scatter its darkness. And in another vital proof of Yeshua's messianic qualifications, Matthew informs his readers that the son of David was also born in the city of David. Since the birth of King David, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, was designated as the city of the beloved leader of Israel. It's only five miles outside of Jerusalem. This small village now takes on even a greater importance as the revelation came through Micah the prophet. The place of Yeshua's birth is not only important to Matthew, but also for those who are seeking this newborn king. It's indeed odd that although the chief priests and the scribes can easily identify the birthplace of the Messiah, they don't join in a search for this Messiah. All the biblical knowledge in the world is of no value if one does not act upon God's revelation to mankind. The term magi can be meant to understand magician, wise men, or astrologers. Because some of these practices are condemned in the Torah, however, it's assumed they were likely non-Jews. But here's a challenging question. How would pagan astrologers know about the coming of Messiah. And equally challenging is, why would they even care? An important clue lies in the phrase, from the east. Most likely these wise men came from the huge province known as Babylon. 
Babylon was a longtime home for the Diaspora Jews, and many Jews still make their home, and did then too, in Babylon in the first century. Now, from your biblical history, you probably recall the, a very famous Jew who rose to political prominence under the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. What was his name? Daniel, that's right. I like audience participation. Our hero Daniel was trained in every manner of wisdom, kokmah in Hebrew, and understanding, bima, or bina. And it says in Daniel 1.17, now as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and proficiency in every kind of wisdom and literature. And Daniel could understand all sorts of visions and dreams in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned him, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers throughout the realm. So we can see here, this is a, a natural connection between these wise men and their understanding of Jewish tradition. We read in Daniel 2.48, after Daniel had interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, at the very least, these magi were familiar with Daniel's writings. In a surprising twist, however, Matthew throws the spotlight on these Gentile outsiders, the Magi, as models of faith. Their dedication to the newborn king stands in stark contrast to the apathy of certain religious leaders. It challenges readers, that's including us, to reconsider their and our own preconceptions about who deserves our admiration. The Magi worship Yeshua. Herod seeks his death. And Jerusalem's religious leaders, at least from his birth, will take Yeshua for granted. The religious leaders, they have their heads steeped in the scriptures, but their hearts are dull to the divine spark, and so they fail to act on their biblical knowledge. Matthew, again, seems to challenge prejudice against outsiders, like the Magi, who will seek Yeshua as Lord and King. For we saw his star in the east, and they have come to worship him. Now, some have suggested that this star could have been a manifestation of the Shekinah, the glory of God. If the Magi knew their scriptures, they would likely be familiar with Numbers 24, 17. For a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. This quotation comes from Balaam's oracle. Remember the guy who tried to curse but wound up blessing Israel? And this star was a sign that a deliverer of Israel would bring about the day of redemption. A later midrash, that's a, a rabbinic commentary called Agat Mashiach, shows how some deduce that Numbers 24, the star, is the star of the Messiah. And during the second Jewish revolt in Rome around 132 to 135 in the Common Era, Rabbi Akiba used this verse to identify the Jewish military general as the Messiah, even calling him by his Aramaic name Bar Kokhba, son of the star. How wonderful to think that the Lord would use his Shekinah, the very weight of his glory, veiled in a celestial beacon, guiding pagan seekers to the promised king of Israel and of the whole world. What a breathtaking display of grace, drawing those farthest from the covenant into the heart of the kingdom. Of course, it's also likely the wise men would have paid special attention to Daniel's prophecy regarding the exact time of Messiah's birth as well. In Daniel 9, the prophet is given a vision of 77s as they relate to the history of the people of Israel. The scripture seems to point to the time of Messiah's appearance exactly 483 years, 69 sevens, after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, Messiah the Prince will be cut off, which many scholars calculate to be the cutting off of the Messiah around the year 30 CE. I know you didn't expect math in this morning's drash, but there you have it. As a result, the wise men not only saw the Messiah's star, but it also appeared when they anticipated his arrival. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, bring word back to me so that I may come and worship him as well. After listening to the king, they went their way. Behold, the star they had seen in the east went on before them 
until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great gladness. And when they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother Miriam, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another way. So as for when the Magi came to Jerusalem, we should note that Matthew probably fast-forwarded, he leaped in time about two years after the birth of Yeshua. We can reckon this from the fact that after Herod hears about this child king, he assumes this threat to his throne is there, and he gives an order to kill, to murder all the Hebrew boys under the age of two. Matthew, in his gospel, particularly here, paints a poignant picture of hope and despair intertwined. Hope and despair intertwined. The Magi's journey symbolizes the promise of a new era, while Herod's action reflect the depth of human fear and the tragic lengths that it can drive us to. This pivotal moment in the history casts a shadow over the arrival of the future king. Also, according to the historian Josephus, there was a, a lunar eclipse just before Herod's death around 5 BCE. Considering all this, it's likely Yeshua was born between 4 and 6 BCE, that this visit of the Magi occurred uh, later than Yeshua's time of birth can be also inferred by the note and when they came into the house, which is not exactly where he was born. Uh, once in the house, the Magi offered gifts to the newborn king. We know these, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Later interpreters saw an allusion to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, giving rise to the tradition that the Magi were kings. So, you know, did you know this? A multitude of camels will cover you, young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of Adonai. Now, each of these gifts, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, was highly symbolic of spiritual truth. Gold was considered an expensive gift fit for royalty. Frankincense was often used as a perfume, even for a bridegroom, you can look at the Song of Songs and see. It's also symbolic of divinity. Also, this incense symbolizes God's presence and the sweetness of our prayers rising to God, reference Exodus 30 and Psalm 141. And myrrh was an anointing oil used in the preparation for death. We remember Nicodemus used myrrh to anoint Yeshua's body after his death. The myrrh also emphasizes Yeshua's humanity and his mortality. All three ingredients are prophetic symbols of the purpose of Messiah's entrance into human history, to be a king, to be the king, to be the bridegroom, and to be the redeemer. No wonder the Magi fell down and worshiped him. Now we see here three different responses to Yeshua. One may say that all people respond in one of these three ways. Herod displayed an open hatred and hostility toward Yeshua. The chief priests and the scribes were indifferent toward Yeshua, all the while maintaining their religious respectability, but unfortunately, they seemed to miss the significance of the times. The wise men sought out Yeshua and worshiped him, even at great cost. That's what true disciples do. Question for us. Do we recognize the sign of the times? Are we wise enough to seek and worship Yeshua in our lives? Well, in comparing the visit of the wise men to an earlier visit by the shepherds, we see Yeshua came to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, to the humble and ignorant first, then to the honorable and learned, to the poor first, and then the rich. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of Adonai appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. 
After the Magi returned to their homeland, Joseph's path took an unexpected turn. Seems like his life is full of unexpected turns. An angel comes to Joseph and instructs him to flee with his family to the safety of Egypt, leaving behind the growing shadows of Herod's wrath. This is the third dream in two chapters, and the second time the angel of the Lord is mentioned. The point is that God took sovereign action to preserve the Messiah, his son. The angel's command was explicit. Stay in Egypt, not only until Herod's death, but until I tell you. Through Matthew's narrative, the father's intervention consistently shields the child from harm. And protection of the child was indeed necessary. Herod was a very bad dude, infamous for his paranoia and erratic behavior. As an Edomian, Herod was a descendant of Esau, Jacob's brother, who sold his inheritance for a bowl of stew. Although Herod was officially Jewish because of the mass conversion of Edomians around 200 BCE, clearly this puppet of Rome was more pagan than a loyal king of Israel. In fact, Herod was so deranged that he killed his own sons, killed his own sons because of the fear of losing his throne. Because of the many executions he ordered, the Emperor Augustus reportedly quipped, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. The joke being that since Herod was at least superficially a Jew, he probably didn't eat pork, therefore his pig was safe. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and went to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death. And this was to fulfill what was spoken of Adonai through the prophet saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Heeding the angel's warning, the family flees by night to Egypt. It's significant to remember that Yeshua was once a refugee. Matthew's account shows us that even in his childhood, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Yeshua and his family survived Herod's murderous plan, but they did so as strangers in a foreign land. Seems a common theme for our people. While some may believe the challenges that faced by Yeshua's disciples, by us, stem from a lack of faith, the outset of Yeshua's own story reminds us that hardship can touch anyone regardless of devotion. While we strive for positive change in the world, following the path of Rabbi Yeshua may sometimes lead to adversity and even persecution. This shouldn't deter us, but rather strengthen our resolve to stand firm in our faith. As also noted in the overview of our gospel that I did a couple weeks ago, Matthew often depicts Yeshua as the new Moses and in this chapter, we observe that Yeshua is rescued in infancy and travels to safety. Interestingly, Matthew notes this escape is also a fulfillment of Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. God summons Israel out of Egypt once more, just as the Lord did for the people of Israel during the Exodus. However, this time, Adonai calls the Messiah on behalf of all of Israel. Matthew's quotation from Hosea reminds us that Yeshua also identifies with his people's heritage. Yeshua appears as one greater than Moses, an heir of God's call to Israel. And as God protected Moses when Pharaoh killed the male Israelite children, God protects Yeshua. Then when Herod saw that he was being tricked by the Magi, he became furious. And he sent and killed all boys in Bethlehem and all the surrounding area from two years old and under, according to the time he determined from the Magi. True to his character and reputation, Herod goes into a fit, an irrational rage. While the Magi's ingenuity in outwitting him may have ignited Herod's fury, in reality, this is good. we have to capture this his rage is against the Lord and the Lord's anointed. Psalm 2.2. 2. A wave of terror swept through Bethlehem as Herod consumed for a desire to crush any potential challenge to his power, ordered the unthinkable. 
the indiscriminate killing of young children under the age of two. Then was fulfilled what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in loud wailing, Rachel sobbing for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Matthew sees a dual fulfillment of prophecy and he quotes Jeremiah 31 where the prophet hears a voice of grief over the destruction of the Jewish people by the Babylonian army in 586 BCE. Matthew's use of Jeremiah's lament adds a layer of depth and meaning to the Bethlehem massacre. He isn't merely recounting a historical event, but drawing a deeper connection to the biblical narrative and the enduring themes of loss, resilience, and faith. Jeremiah sees the symbolic mother of the Jewish people, Rachel, risen from the dead and weeping from heaven over the suffering of her people as she watches tens of thousands of her children being taken captive and banished from Israel. Rachel refuses to be consoled because her children are not there. She's distraught. For some background, Rachel, who died giving birth to Benjamin, was buried according to Genesis 35, 19, on the way to Bethlehem. And according to tradition, Rachel's body was not buried with the other matriarchs at the cave of Machpelah because Jacob prophetically saw that the Jews would pass by her burial place as they were being, as they were exiting, being exiled to Babylon. According to Talmud, uh, Genesis or Bereshit Rabbah 82.10, as the captives passed by, Rachel would tearfully plead to God on their behalf. Will you cause my children to be exiled on this account? As Jeremiah's prophecy was first fulfilled by the Babylonian exile, so too is their anguish in Ramah in the first century over the tragic murder of Jewish children. How much greater would the grief be if the Messiah, the hope of Israel, had been slain prematurely? In Yeshua's story, we see a God who chooses to share not only our joy, but also our burdens. God called his son Yeshua to identify with the suffering in the exile of the people. Though Rachel's lament in Jeremiah 31 resonates with profound grief, it also holds threads of hope. God's words of comfort, promising eventual restoration, often a glimpse of light amidst the shadow of loss. Thus says Adonai, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work will be rewarded. It is declaration of Adonai when they will return from the land of the enemy. So there is a hope for your future. It is a declaration of Adonai when your children will return to their own territory. In Jeremiah, God offers Rachel solace amidst the exile, whispering a promise of her children's return to the land. This powerful image echoes in the Gospels where God's unwavering love for us is assured, affirming that nothing can separate us from Messiah's steadfast presence and love. And just as Herod could not stop God's will for Messiah's life and the fulfillment of Yeshua's divine mission in the first century, so even now, none of the Herods of this age can stop God's will. For our lives and our future are in Messiah. Yeshua's identification with his people speaks of a God who feels human pain as deeply as we do. It's a broken people wounded by this world's evil. Yeshua's sharing of our pain offers a consolation deeper than reasoned arguments. God truly understands and cares and paid an awful price to begin to make the world better. The heir to David's throne has come. The exile is over. The true son of God has arrived. And through the new covenant promised by Jeremiah, we have a firm foundation in the hope we have in him. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of Adonai appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, get up, 
take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those seeking the child's life are dead. So he got up. He took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But hearing that Archelaus was the king of Judea in place of his father Herod, he became afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee. So the family remained in Egypt until the death of Herod, just like the angel ordered. This is the fourth dream, the third time the angel of the Lord is mentioned once again. God demonstrates his divine protection for the child. The angel's order to return to the land of Israel, now that Herod is dead, reminds one of Exodus chapter 4. Sorry, I got behind one slide. Then Adonai said to Moses and Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men that sought your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, set them on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Jewish readers would have been connected to the Exodus account. and They would have seen Matthew's narrative where, like Moses, Yeshua had survived his persecutor and would lead his people to salvation. Now, after his death, Herod the Great's kingdom was divided among his three sons. I mentioned Archelaus, who was a cruel and tyrannical, just as bad as his dad. And he received the territories of Judea, Samaria, and Edomia. So it made sense that Joseph obeyed the angelic vision, the fifth and final dream, by bypassing Judea and headed to their hometown of Nazareth in the Galilee to evade Herod's son. Here, Matthew alludes to another messianic prophecy concerning Yeshua's life. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets that Yeshua would be called a Nazareth. Now, while Nazareth seems an insignificant town, Matthew stresses that it was of divine importance. However, there's no specific prophecy about Nazareth in the Tanakh. While contemporary religious leaders may have put forth the question, can anything good come from Nazareth? Matthew makes it clear that there's a divine significance in Nazareth being Yeshua's hometown. But there's a problem. There's a problem. Matthew claims that Yeshua moved to Nazareth to live in order that he might fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, that he'd be called a Nazarene. However, no such prophecy is made by a Tanakh prophet. Did Matthew make a mistake? Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Matthew did not say that any particular Old Testament prophet, singular, stated this. He simply affirmed that the Old Testament prophets, plural, predicted that Yeshua would be called a Nazarene. So we should not expect to find any given verse, but a general truth found in many prophets to correspond to his Nazarene-like character. There are several suggestions as to how Yeshua could have fulfilled, brought to completion this truth. Some point to the fact that Yeshua fulfilled the requirements of the Tanakh, one part of which was a holy commitment to make a vow of a Nazarite. The Nazarite took the vow to separate himself to the Lord, and Yeshua perfectly fulfilled this. However, the word is different both in Hebrew and Greek, we know that Yeshua never took this vow, or we don't see that in the scripture. Others point to the fact that Nazareth comes from the basic Hebrew word netzer, which means branch, and many prophets spoke of Messiah as the branch. Still others note that the city of Nazareth, where Yeshua was born, was a despised place. Yesh Nazareth was on the other side of the tracks, if you will. And this is evident in Nathaniel's response, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In this sense, Nazarene was a term of scorn appropriate to the Messiah, whom the prophets predicted would be despised and rejected by men. Well, as we come to a close this morning, as Messiah steps onto the stage of human history, as detailed in these first two chapters of Matthew, Matthew paints a vibrant picture of diverse responses. Some erupt in joyful celebration while others struggle with fear, 
or skepticism. And some even try to stop God's plan of redemption and reconciliation. And yet we see the strong arm of the Lord protecting his son, firmly committed to the success of the mission to which the Lord has appointed Messiah. We're going to witness a deeper revelation to Yeshua as the full embodiment of the Father as we continue through this Gospel of Matthew. Yeshua is meek and lowly, one who walked among the first disciples and died for his people. And he is the one who would empower Matthew's readers, including us, Yeshua's disciples, to fulfill the task that he's given them and given us. And as we move more deeply in this Gospel account, this report from the battlefield, we should watch. We should listen to how Matthew continues to show the character and the heart of Yeshua and how we as a disciple should orient our lives in him. As Trent mentioned, um, and I give credit to my, uh, my partner in crime here, uh, Cindy Gould, who has helped me develop these questions. Actually, she's doing the yeoman's work here. Uh, we're going to send these out weekly. We'll probably try to send them out Monday is our goal. Uh, and they're for your reflection. Again, small groups discuss them. Uh, they're not, what did it say in verse 1? What did it say in verse 2? I hope that they're challenging. But I do uh, solicit your feedback on that. Well, next week we're going to move into Matthew chapter 3, where we're going to be introduced to John the Immerser and witness the immersion, the baptism of Yeshua. And as his disciples, we must pay close attention to Yeshua's actions and words. As we said in one of the discussion questions, we should be so close to our Messiah that his dust of his sandals being kicked up flies in our face. We are called, you see, to join Yeshua in his immersion. And we'll talk more about that next time. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for this word, this report from the battlefield, which is also Besorah, good news. But Lord, it's not good news if we don't act upon it. It's empty if we don't make it part of our lives. But you have said that your word would not return void. So we're sort of holding you to your word. <laughs> As we engage your words, let those words not return to you void, but you see fruit for the kingdom in us as we die to ourselves and live in Yeshua. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together on page 106 and 107 for the words of the Amidah. Excuse me, the Elenu. Alenu lishabag le adon akol le tei gedula le yotze bereshit she lo asanu kegai haratot ve lo hosamanu kamish bofot hadama she lo sarchel kenu kahem ve gohor alenu kechohamonam ve anachnu kori. Mishtachavim o modim Lifne melech Marche hamlachim Hakadosh baruch Shehu no te shamayim Ve yoser aretz O Moshe yikaro Ve shamayim imaal Ushkina tu zo Ushkina tu zo Begare me romi Eloheinu ein od Emet malkeinu efe zulato Kakatu betorato Viedata hayom Viedata hayom Vehashevota elevavecha Ki Adonai hua Elohim Vashamayim mimaal the Alha Aretz, the Alha Aretz, Mitachat Einod. The kingdom is yours, and to all eternity you will reign in glory. Venema, Vehaya Adonai, 
Please remain standing if you are um, honoring, are you in mourning and honoring the loss of a loved one for yard sites at a mourner's cottage on page 108 and 109. <laughs> Ose shalom remamav u yaase shalom aleinu v'yalko Yisrael v'emru. Amen. May he who makes peace in his heavens make peace for us, for all Israel, and for all the world. We respond together. Amen. Well, please rise for the blessings. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri HaGafen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. We acknowledge you, Yeshua, as the true vine. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Aretz. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And we love you, Yeshua. You are the bread of life. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Say hello to somebody you don't know.